welcome to the AI Paper Club podcast, where every month we invite a data science expert to the show to highlight and discuss an academic paper from the AI machine learning and data science literature. I am one of your hosts, Rafael Herrera, and with me today is my co-host, Sonia Marks, data scientist and generative AI ambassador at Deeper Insights. Sonia, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you, Raf. I'm very excited for this one. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about this one, too, because it's going to cover an interesting topic. Overall, we're going to be discussing a little bit about music and AI, but our guest is going to be talking to us about a very specific paper today, and that guest is Joan Roseo. He's a data scientist at Deeper Insights as well, and he brought us a very interesting paper uh, tell us, what is the paper and who wrote it? Hey, Raf, Thank you for having me. So, yes, the paper is called Simple and Controllable Music Generation by Meta AI, which is a paper about music generation. Yeah, our friends at Meta are constantly pumping out these, these amazing papers and tools, and most of them tend to be open source from what I can see. So maybe if, if you're listening... You could try this at home. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Let's dig right into it then, Joan. Tell us, what's this paper about? What are, what are we learning from this one? So basically, uh, Meta made headlines last year when they, they released this model because the model capability surpassed the ones of the previous best model, which was Music LM by Google. And this new model actually has added a plus of being trained on licensed music data and also being open sourced for non-commercial use. And in addition to uh, generating audio from text prompts, Music Gen can also generate music based on a given reference melody, which is a feature known as melody conditioning. Awesome. And I also read that it's a single stage transformer language model. So it's learning from these large language models that we use for completely different purposes. Instead, I don't know how, what was the, the Google model like in terms of architecture, but it seems like to, for this one, it was very important, this efficiency to be just one single model to be trained. Yes. So the model architecture is quite interesting here because it tackles two types of, of data. You have first the text input and then you have the audio input. With the text input, you basically encode it with the text-to-text transformer, like T5, for example, and this is where you get the text embeddings. And then you have also the audio input, which is uh, usually a continuous vector with a very, very large, large size. And what you do here is you encode it using an encoder called Encodec, which is a model specific for encoding audio vectors because they are very, very big. And at some point there, you have an LSTM as well to capture the temporal data in, in your audio input. And then finally, you, you actually compress it even further, applying residual vector quantization, which not only actually compresses the, the original audio input, but also makes it a discrete vector. And then at, at, in, in there, you have close attention between your text embeddings and your audio embeddings. And finally, you can decode uh, your your embeddings using, again, the encoded decoder and you get the output audio. Yeah, it's very cool. You mentioned residual vector quantization that is used for compression. I know this the type of data that is used in music. I just learned because I was not very acquainted with this field. I'm more of a computer vision data scientist. So this uh, technique is used for compressing the data, which is huge in terms of music data. There's also a mention of the code books, which are a very interesting concept that was new to me. Can you explain it, what this code books and what residual vector quantization is? Audio signals are actually very, very big. Because for example, for music, to be able to listen to music properly as a human being, you need to listen to it at a sampling rate of 32 kilohertz, which that means that to represent that as a vector, only one second of audio at that sampling rate would be represented by a 32,000 size vector. So a vector of 32,000 real numbers. That is a very, very big uh, vector. And what you need to do is encode it and then further compress it and discretize it. So what you do here in residual vector quantization is you take an original embedding, which is in a, a continuous vector. And then you have code books, which are like books of vectors of the same dimension of, as the vector that you're trying to encode. And you compare your original vector to every vector in the code book and calculate the residual. And you find the code book vector that is closest to your original embedding and has the smallest residual. And then what you do is you have the residual and also the index of the vector in the code book that you're using. So for example, if you're using the vector number five in the code book, you take index number five. Then 
you use your residual of the first call book and you compare it to the vectors of call book number two. And you do the same, you find the actual vector in call book number two that is closest to the residual of call book number one. And you take also the, the index, for example, index number three. And this way you do it over and over again with as many call books as you have. But for example, this way you can express your original embedding uh, as a vector of indices of code books that is has the length of as many code books as, as you have. And this way you represent your embedding in a discrete manner. And then you can also reconstruct your original embedding by just summing the vectors that you have used from each code book. And also it's, it's good to know that these code books can be learned during training. So they can be designed to best adapt to the current data and best represent and decompose your original embeddings so that you would have, for example, an embedding of size D and then can, that can be reduced to a size C, which is C being the number of, of code books that you're using. And because the code books are trained, they can be very accurate and you would actually reduce the dimensionality of the embedding by a lot by not losing that much information. So looking at this paper, I'm, I'm wondering what is particularly unique from this? Uh, what is it that, what idea came out of this paper more so than anything else? Because I know there are a lot of different tools and this is not the very first musically influenced or audio influenced uh, paper or research or anything. But what specific thing comes out of this paper that you feel really stood out to you? So basically the important part here is that it does music generation, but with melody conditioning. That's the, the new part, melody conditioning, where you actually also not only provide the text prompt to generate the music, but also a melody that kind of guides the model to produce an audio that is similar to that melody that you have given and also complies with the text prompt that you have provided. So a challenge that they faced was that they need to actually provide the melodies to the model. And so you would have a training data set of audio clips and then descriptions that match these audio clips. But then you also have to extract the melody from the other clip. And what does actually constitute a, a melody? You know, it could be the bass line, or sometimes it's the melody of the voice or the guitar. It's very hard to say. So the method for extracting the melody is to consider actually the most dominant one, typically identified as the loudest melody in the mix. And for that, they use chromograms. Chromograms are just widely used representation that visually display the most dominant musical notes throughout a track. And they also found that in tracks that included all the elements in the recording, the chromographs were a bit noisy and you could tell a bit what were the most dominant notes, but it was sometimes hard to follow. And Meta found that by extracting the rhythmic elements like the drums or the bass from the songs and taking them out, then the chromogram of the remaining elements was way more clean and showed the melody in a more clear pattern. And they actually did that using demooks, which is uh, also Meta's own tool for actually separating sources in an audio mix. What was the name of that tool again? It's demooks, T-E-M-U-C-S. Okay, how, how long has that been around? So that has been around actually for a couple of years, but they have been improving the model over and over again and improving the architecture. Oh, okay. Very interesting. This realm of music AI is so broad and it's new to a lot of us uh, listening probably what type of other like applications i know you love music and you kind of have it as a knobby to also create music what type of applications that music ai can be used for that excites you the most and I, you think would be more useful for someone that is creating music so the two applications that i can see that excite me the most are the generation and the source separation. First, with generation, I think it's, it makes music very accessible for people that actually don't have that much technical training of music. So, for example, you could definitely just like hum a melody into a phone and you have a melody, or you could write a prompt to just, you know, give you an idea of an instrumental that will have that melody in the genre of rock or the genre of pop with some strings, or you can be as detailed as, detail as possible. And so the music generation tool would just generate already an audio file that you can use for sampling or like layering your own compositions. And so you don't have to really know how to play a keyboard, for example. You can just know how to do all of this just by chopping audios and just using prompts 
and recording on a phone, which is very, very, very interesting. And then the other one is uh, the stem separation. So this, this process of separating uh, an audio mix into its individual components, because this way, if you have old songs and you're listening to a song and you're like, oh, I really like the, the, the guitar line in, in this song, I would like to use it in my in my song, but I don't know how to extract it. But you can use this AI to extract just the guitar, and then you have the individual guitar, you can sample it, you can actually sample the sound as well. It's just very, very interesting. Could you walk me through how that separation piece happens? Because I feel like that is, in my mind, as a non-technical person, it seems impossible. I wasn't able to do it when I was in high school trying to figure out what a bass line for a song was. So it seems so hard to me as a human, but it's, how does a computer accomplish this in what seems to be very easy means? Yeah, so this social separation is a very hard task to do because audio is a waveform. And so when you're trying to extract different elements from the mix, you're basically trying to separate a wave into different waves. And sometimes, you know, certain elements like the voice and the guitar may have similar frequencies that have waves that overlap. And it's very, very hard to extract it and separate them. But neural networks are perfect for this kind of stuff. If you have good data and a lot of data, neural networks can find patterns in very complex data and uh, perform pretty, pretty complicated tasks. And so what they do here is that they have a training data set with, with audio mixes and also their individual data sources. So you have the vocals of the mix and then the jars of the mix and the guitar individually and you would feed that to a model and the model would learn what the individual parts of, of the mix are represented like inside the actual mix and learn how to extract them. This method here uh, uses also a spectrogram, which is another way to uh, represent audio. So one, one way was to represent audio in a vector form of, of real numbers and the other way actually you can represent an audio through a spectrogram, which is a 2D representation like an image. So what you do is you go through sections of the audio wave and you look at the first section and you have the wave of that section and you extract the period features of that wave, which would be a vector. And that vector actually makes the first column of the spectrogram. And you look at the next section of the audio wave, you again extract the period features and make the second column of the spectrogram and so on, so on, so on. And this way, from an audio wave, you can construct a 2D matrix. And this actually used in many models as well. So this model for source separation, in particular called Demux, which is from Meta, uses both the audio wave input as a continuous vector and also the spectrogram. And they are both encoded, the vector in 1D and the spectrogram in 2D. And then they are applied cross attention when they are actually encoded in the you know black box of the model. And they, they are again decoded to extract the individual waveforms uh, of the individual instruments of the mix. Wow, this is a quite complex uh, structure. But yeah, it, it's very cool to see how, for example, you can see a spectrogram as an image. So there are always, and it also this model is based on a transformer that is us usually uh, an architecture that is usually used also for language. So there is a lot of overlap between fields in AI which is very good for us that we can have some transfer learning between <laughs> between image and audio and uh, and text. What are some, because I, I read... Sonia, hold on, before you go on, I'm, you mentioned text has to do with this. What does text have to do with audio and music and all this? Because that, that, that's really interesting. How, how is that intertwined in all this magic? Well, the, the way I see it is that the architecture, the Transformer architecture, was designed to handle text but it's actually the way that the data is encoded can vary. So the inputs are being adapted to this architecture, no matter what the source is. So it started with text, but we also have vision transformers. And now I see that it's also used for audio. So it really shows how one single architecture can be used for so many fields. And that's actually very interesting on how maybe can play a, a part on multimodal applications. Is this related to CLAP, which I think you mentioned? Uh, how, yes. I've so, heard this one. Yeah, give, give me the rundown. How's that work? So basically, uh, there was a new... So we have this source separation tool, but what, the problem with this source separation model, like Demox, for example, is that it can only separate the sources that it has been trained on. So it has been trained on 
a mix and then the the piano file and then the guitar file and the vocal file and then the rest you can only separate in these kind of uh, labels you can separate for example a bass if you hadn't been trained on it but what they have actually released recently is a paper called separate anything you describe which is a, a model that mixes this demos architecture of such separation with clap which is a model that relates words with sounds and vice versa and this way they managed to actually be able to separate whatever you describe. So if you tell the model, I want the bass sound on the second verse of the song uh, with the delay effect, and it will do that, you know, so you can be way more precise and have way more applications for it. Okay, so that is the bridge that links everything. So this model knows how to separate melodies, but it maybe doesn't know what each of those melodies are. It just knows this data is all the same and it's all this thing. But then Clap says, hey, actually, that thing that you're holding on to is a piano piece, by the way. Now you know what it is. And then the AI is like, oh, cool. Now I know what a piano piece is. And then kind exactly. of go from there. So essentially, it learns through that. So all these different models are linking together to build a musical AI transformer so that it can do the job that, that, that it needs to do, right? Exactly. Yeah, I, I love that because, you know, you always hear about the foundational pieces like, oh, it can do this now. But now you're starting to see that combination. You're seeing that transformation, though, that you're starting to see the transformer bit where they start to link together and create something a little bit more interesting. And I think music is an excellent place to have some more of this because I think, Sonia, you were touching on this a little bit earlier, the fact that there's so many possible uh, applications for something like this. I know that if I was, you know, in high school and I had this application, I would have loved it because, you know, if I was in a band, I had that bass. I would love to have learned uh, how to play bass by separating pieces from songs and then just repeating them and doing things like that. So that's uh, what billion trillion dollar idea out there for anybody that wants to start uh, making something like this. But uh, I'm going to go with trillion, probably trillion. But people are definitely going to be learning how to not only write songs, develop beats, play instruments and everything like that with these simple tools, well, quote unquote, simple tools. But how available are things like this? Does the average person, like right now, if I wanted to, could I replace Brian Johnson from ACDC with Bon Scott? so that I can have him sing all the new songs because Bon Scott died before? You know, like, can I do that just at home, just for fun? You can do it. There's uh, research and models that are able to do these things, but they are not readily available for the consumer. So I think the next focus of AI music needs to be not on making more innovations and more, like, um, research uh, models, but actually how you commercialize that, how you build a business, how you make these models ready to use for the end user so that musicians can start exploring easily because for now uh, to do this task some musicians have to actually train their own models to perform the tasks that they want to achieve natural language is being used as input or like clap that you were mentioning which is i think as a link between clip which is another model that links the text to images, basically text describing uh, the the images that they see. Now this is describing audio, which is even more interesting. But it's a good point that maybe it's very technical to use these applications, these techniques. So maybe ChatGPT in the future can have like a music application where maybe these type of tasks are even more available to for commercial use or everyday use for the average person that is used using ChatGPT. Now, in my researching before we did this podcast, I did come across something that was similar to what I was describing. I'm not sure if either of you have heard of it, but it's Realistic Voice Cloning, RVC. And it seems to have the potential to do a lot of what I was describing, where you could just clone a voice. And you know what? Today, I want Frank Sinatra to sing, you know, Baby Got Back. Or I want Elvis to sing Bohemian Rhapsody and things like that. So... There is a potential for that. And even if you Google AI music covers on YouTube, you will find all sorts of wonderful things. I heard uh, Freddie Mercury sing Skyfall, originally by Adele, and it was great. I loved it. It really made me miss Freddie Mercury. But I, and I think that's the weird world that we're walking into is that these voices that we all love may never die. 
that that will always have these people in our lives. Yes, but I think this also will be regulated because the artists are not happy about this. To be honest, they don't want their voices to be leveraged and used in other songs because they want to have the copyright. So I think AI will actually be copyrighted, and if you use someone's audio likeness, then you will have to actually pay a fee for it. I think that's the most sensitive, sensible way to do. That's true. There could be copyright and regulation, all that, all of that. But in reality, these tools are available right now, and anyone can do, go on to a Google Colab and do it. So if it's regulated in the future, sure, maybe officially I can't create songs that sound like Britney Spears, but in my garage I can make those songs, and then, I mean, maybe I won't be able to make money off of them, but I'll still be able to produce them. And, I mean, what's to stop that? I could still have my own playlist of Britney Spears singing all of the Johnny Cash songs that I want. Wow. Yeah, definitely. And also what you could do is, uh, if you are not a singer, I think producers will actually gain the most out of this because producers are the ones who made the tracks and, and do the recordings. They not, don't necessarily need to sing. But if you can train a model that uh, sings well and with a voice that is not... Is, that has a tone and theme that you actually like, that don't have to be a famous person. And you can actually just like record your vocals that are like very average and then put them through an AI and the AI will actually sing them with a nice tone that you would actually envision the song for. So yeah, you can actually have an emergence of AI artists, for example, which is very interesting. Yeah, that's a bit scary. <laughs> when I heard that idea, the first thing I thought of was Mother's Day present. I... <laughs> I could create a full 12-track album of me singing my mother's favorite songs and then give it to her. And what mother wouldn't love that, right? I'm not sure no. about the answer, Russ. <laughs> well, my mom would because she's cool. So, so there's that. <laughs> there's so much potential for silly things like that or, or even serious things. I mean, obviously you heard the about, you know, robocalls using politicians' voices and things like that in the U.S. So... There is obviously a potential for some danger, but when it comes to music, there's mostly just the potential of uh, money being lost by some companies. So at the very least, we can do this for fun in our own homes and maybe do something cool like that. So all I'm saying is, folks, that Christmas is coming and maybe your favorite songs will be sung by me and the, and the gift that I'm going to give you all. We are so lucky to be alive <laughs> in this Watch day and age. <laughs> Well, Joan, I think that's an excellent place to kind of stop. We have covered so much. I think there's a lot of potential for the future. So let's just leave it at that. Come back and see where we are in a year or so. And maybe we'll all have our own, you know, music contract. So who knows? But thank you for coming to the show. Really appreciate that. And to our listeners, if you like discussing data science and academic papers, please subscribe to the feed. We release our podcasts monthly and would love to have you along for the ride. We always enjoy that. If you have any questions or want to reach out to us, please email us at thepaperclub at deeperinsights.com. And until then, I want to thank my guest, Joanne, Sonia, my co-host. Uh, we're on here. We're loving this AI stuff, and we hope to talk to you next time. So thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.